Well, I've got to go. Now, you know on television, they always roll these credits right at the end of the show and to make the guy look good. <laughs> well, in radio, we do the same thing, except that you can't see them. That was Chuck Roy, and I just signed off like that. And, uh, you know, it was fun listening, but again, we were hearing other things. Take a look at a KXLA playlist, the other station across the street. And you can see that Steppenwolf and Cream and Creed and Clearwater were on there. But besides those songs, there was a lot of stuff that maybe we didn't want to listen to. A lot of stuff that didn't sound like the, the, the music we were listening to on our turntables at home. All right, let's skip that. We're having technical difficulties here. But I don't want to take up any more time than I have to here because I don't have the stories to tell these guys do. All right, let's just remember for a while what was mixed in with all the good music. This was on the chart. We've been here at the LPs. We've been going to the sound factory. We've been going to the trip room to film more. And hearing and seeing music that was different Eric doing cinnamon. And uh, we wanted to hear something different. I'd be fired for this, Amanda. Dead air. So, anyway, there was a group of people who got together and convinced the radio station owners to do something different and said, you know, they've been inspired by a by the radio papers in the market who wanted to bring it back to the so, uh, you know, they set up the radio station, and on November 8th, 1968, Freeform Radio suddenly became a part of the landscape in Sacramento at the Elks Building, it's still there. And uh, through this particular door, door, um, Freeform Radio was born, TASAP was created, and it was done in the spirit of revolution, whether it was revolution against parents, sexual mores, or whatever. It was something completely different than that. Now, I wasn't there. I was likely at home thinking that Top 40 was all there was. These guys were here, so I'm going to turn everything over to them to tell the story of how KZAP got started in 1968. And who we have here is Ed Fitzgerald, who was the original general manager. Jeff Houston was there on day one. He was the music director. Terry Nosler was there the first day, and Charlie Peace. And we want to thank all the leaders. The guys, I'm going to turn over to you, but first I want to say that we've got a cut from Freeform Baby, which is an upcoming documentary film. And this is an exclusive 20 minute cut that we're going to start at about 7.35 after some question and answer, so stick around for that. And in the meantime, we're going to let these guys tell the story of Freeform Radio in Sacramento. Ed? Well, you say uh, in the beginning, which is a good place to start. Bay Area boy here, and uh, I was working with what became the owner of KZAP. At that time, it was a different call letter, owned by a fellow by the name of Dale Fuelli. It was up on the Oaks Temple, and the station was off the air. And uh, a fellow by the name of Lee Gehagen, we have, uh, that's B, that's not B, there's B, Princeton University. Came out uh, one summer, in the summer of '67, and said, uh, "Having worked at Princeton Radio, I love radio. I want to own a radio station, and of course, he had the uh, the money to do it. So I was working for his radio station, which he already purchased, KPGM, down in Los Altos, having a great time doing part-time radio, that sort of thing, in my blood, you might say. And he says, "Hey, how would you like to be the manager of a radio station?" that I'm thinking of purchasing, uh, it's dark at the moment, and I thought, what do you mean by dark? What was that? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So one thing led to another, and uh, we went on up to Sacramento and petitioned the FCC because they were about to take that frequency, 98.5, and discard it because there was a station in San Jose, uh, and they thought, well, there could be interference. Well, we brought that to a halt. And November 8th, 1968 was the day that we got 
that station on the air. Couldn't get it on any sooner. First of all, we had to find a call letter. And back then, uh, there weren't too many, if any, KZ calls. And it was an attorney with the FCC that actually called us one day and said, look, um, KSAC, you can't have that. That's for Strategic Air Command. And uh, we thought of KJAZ, well, that call letter's in the Bay Area. He says, you know, there's some Z calls out there. How about KCIT? Basic? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, what do you think of uh, Kazak? Well, I didn't like the way it said it, but I liked KZAB. So that's how the call letter came to me. And uh, so that very humble beginning, this little 3,500-watt radio station sitting at the top of the Elks Temple is what became KZAP. And uh, you can't say, well, the rest is history. There's a lot of history. I, I remember having to negotiate a lease at the Elks Temple. The Elks Temple. Emphasis on the Elks. Well, what are you going to do up there? Well, it's a radio station. Well, what kind of music? Oh, maybe jazz, uh, you know. Don't say rock and roll. <laughs> so the bottom line is we signed on, and well, at that time, this gentleman had much longer hair. Uh, I had to become an elk. <laughs> I had to explain a day or two or three later, who is that person and why is he in my building? It kind of uh, educated the elks very quickly over a very short period of time, but they couldn't break the lease. We had a lease. And by the way, we were very good tenants. We took very good. You saw our door. I mean, that was a pretty nice door. It was brand new. We also cleaned that place up and uh, put it on the air. And for the next few years, a lot of strange looking long haired people came up in the elevator, went down in the elevator, but the bottom line is KZAP endured. Now at this point, I'll turn it over to Jeff, because he's going to tell you how we got our music library and how on God's earth you keep this thing going, because we have no money. And money came from advertising. And advertising came from sponsors. And sponsors would say, I don't know if I want to be on your radio station. It was very new. Go for it, Jeff. I don't know whether it would be able to win forever. Um, yeah, and Ed is right. I mean, me and Ed, Charlie, and I think, I think Carrie, although Carrie might have come in a little bit later. We, hammers and nails. We built the station, cut wood, we built it by hand, you know. Um, and I was uh, a teenager. I was, uh, I graduated high school in June, went to work for KZAP in August. And, uh, but I had worked at, in the, in that building uh, under the previous owner, uh, and it was a pop in the daytime, jazz at night, and uh, you got paid a dollar an hour, and every two weeks, half the checks were clear. So because I was a high school student, I got out of school at three and went right to the bank, and mine always cleared. Uh, but uh, Tom Donahue, the legendary big daddy, Tom Donahue, k San Radio, Metro Media, etc., cetera, uh, was a, a friend and advisor to Kesa from even from before we went on the air. Ed and Lee talked to uh, Big Daddy about, well, we got this license, we're thinking of doing classical or maybe rock. And, and Tom said, it'd be crazy if it be rock. So, uh, you know, when it came time to set up the library, I went down and visited with Tom, saw theirs was set up, and he was kind enough to give me a list of all the promo guys for all the labels. So we could contact them and start getting service. And um, they would be happy to serve us with the, the new releases. They weren't so thrilled about giving us boxes of catalog, older records. And there's an interesting story. So I don't want to step on your story. It's really your story. You want to do it? Um, yeah, I thought it was a station wagon. Right what was it? Yeah, okay. So, so Charlie knew a guy at Tower Records, uh, who stayed with the company until he went broke. But um, he, 
he, he told Charlie, hey, come on down, do what you need, you know? And we, and we wanted depth. I mean, we wanted the tribes of New Guinea, we wanted koto music, we wanted, you know, folk, bluegrass, blues, and, and rock, and rock and roll, you know? So Charlie went down there one day and picked boxes of boxes of records, loaded up his coupe, Sedan, the sedan, I'm sorry. A little bit of Stan, and, and, uh, and that was our starting library. Now, I told this story to Russ Solomon about a year, year and a half ago, and I said, I don't know if you know about that. He goes, no, I didn't. I said, well, thanks, sorry. And he goes, oh, that's okay. He says, that's, that's the way things were back in those days. Don't worry about it. I said, okay, thanks, Russ. Russ is in, in the movie, uh, Freeform Baby, FM Radio Revolution. Um, but then I was just music director, so I stayed in touch with the labels and got a service and got a records to give away over the air and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the way I got the job uh, was working at, I think it was Cakes Ricky. Um, they said, hey, we went off here in two weeks. Um, you know, they're going to sell the station. I said, who's going to buy it? two guys. So I got Ed's phone number. I called him up, came to my house, and I had this huge record collection, you know, on shelves, and music categories, and alphabetical, and chronological, and classic sleeves, and the whole thing. And he looked at it and said, well, maybe you could be our music director. Guys, <laughs> but they come with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, not only did they, yeah, you, you wanted to use them, but I, I wasn't going to let my press, precious records go to a radio station and just get mugged, you know. So I got the job, you didn't get the records. Um, yeah, you reminded me of that. We now know how we got the records. Yeah. And Thanks, uh, Charlie. Yeah, and Russ Russell found out, out, what, 25, 35 years later? Yeah, he laughed about it. He says, no, oh, that's okay, we'll come back up 30 seconds. Well, actually, you saw that I was unloading. Oh. Said, Where did you get Oh, did I? No. Yeah. Ed did. Oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah. I did. I remember saying, wait a second, I don't want to know. Exactly. Um, I the only thing to make a payroll. The only thing I would add is that KZM, typical of these pioneering radio stations in each market, we were the community. We were, we were integrated totally with the community. We would advertise, you know, pre peace rallies, demonstrations. You know, uh, if you were having a bake sale for um, MAD or you know, Mother's Against Drunk Driving or, or whatever the thing was, community, we talked about it on the air, give it publicity, and uh, we did the same thing with local music. We, bands would bring us tapes, we did the tapes, and uh, it, it was really like a family. In fact, in the early years, we referred to us ourselves and to the audience as a KZAP family. And everywhere you'd go, people would talk to you, go, hey, in the case of family, was, yeah, yeah, you know, this and, and and it was just great. It was just like uh, it was just a beautiful experience because we were right in the middle of peace and love, and so we lived it. And and politics, I believe, you know, and peace, love, and politics, and we we fought against the war in Vietnam, and we publicized all the good things, and we would give away free things, and we would, we would announce rides if you need a ride for Bay Area. You know, call us. We'll announce it. Somebody will give you a ride to the Bay Area. So it was very intimate, small town. We took public service announcements, literally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're required to do my turn. We have time limits. <laughs> my part of the journey actually began after college. It is all Began when you hear it. Began after college when. During that period of time, I graduated and had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do, so I went on little pilgrimages. I just traveled around trying to see what was going on and get myself involved in something. And I was living in Palo Alto, across from Stanford University, and I would volunteer at the radio station because I thought I was a student. <laughs> but I just would go in there and play records. But I was going through the FM dial one day, and I, I hear the station that I've never even imagined could exist, and it was KMPX in San Francisco, which became the forerunner 
after all the jocks went on strike and they were making incredible, the station was making a lot of money, but they weren't paying the jocks anything. So that folded and it went into KSAN. But I was listening to a style of music that just really floored me. I thought, wow, that's it. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to be involved in something like that. So I had no idea how to do that. I realized, you know, going in on Saturday nights at the Stanford radio station wasn't going to do it. So there were advertisements for the Columbia School of Broadcasting. I think I'm the only guy that ever really went through the Columbia School of Broadcasting. I went to San Francisco. They signed me up. They guaranteed I was going to be great. I went home and did my first day and cried because I sounded so bad. I thought, oh, God, they're taking all my money. So I went back to Sacramento, and I just really worked hard. And I got mixed up with this guy who was selling radio time from a disc jockey in New York. It was, uh, what was his name? Bill McCormick was his name, and he had, uh, who was the fellow in Cocoon? One of the older guys, uh, Don Amici. Well, Jim Amici was his brother, and he was a big shot New York disc jockey, and he would get Jim Amici to do spots for local station, for local businesses in the Sacramento area. So, I mean, he, he would do that, but then he would never get the spots for the people. He was the nicest crook I ever met. And so he asked me what I would like to do, because I didn't want to work for him anymore because it was really bad. And I said, you know, I've heard this station. I would like to play this kind of music. And I played it for him. He said, let me see what I can do. So he goes to the station on Auburn Boulevard, KJML, and he brokers a deal with this guy. No one ever listened to that station. All the owner did was broker things for tires and things like that. And so he said, I got you three hours at night, 9 to 12. He said, we're going to call it the fantasy machine. So I went to Jack's House of Music and I got a trade out with it. I carried all my music up to the station every night. And I started doing this kind of my version of underground radio. Second night on the air, I get a call. The guy says, this is Ed Fitzgerald. We're going to start a radio station. How would you like to come work for us? And I'm thinking, wow, this radio stuff. Like doesn't pay you either. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, this radio stuff is great. I've been on the air two days and I got another <laughs> job. Well, we got going, and uh, fortunately, it became too good, and Ed, I mean, the guy that broke at the time never paid for it, so the guy kicked us all out of there, and I went back to Ed, and he said, okay, you can start on the radio station, and I remember going there the first day and realizing that I was probably the least musically informed person there. <laughs> I was into the times. I was into the ambiance of the era. And to me, it was, a, it was an avenue for self-exploration, which is what I was into. I was into my health stuff. I was into kind of my spiritual quest. Everybody was into something in those days. When you met somebody, said, hey, what are you into? You know, and you'd get some of these great answers about what people were doing. And I brought the first two people. I brought Sacramento Real Food Company on 15th and Q. And I brought Joe Dett and the famous soup shop. And Joe Dett just loved me. And for those two things, Ed gave me a commission on the top of my $165 a month, which was for six days. <laughs> but it was great. I always had money. I couldn't figure it out. I always had money in those days for $165 a month in my little folks' way. That was a great time. I worked there for a year and a half as a disc jockey, took some bad advice from an area astrologer, quit, and came back later in the guise of Captain Carroll. That's another story. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you very quickly how we made payroll, by the way, the first time, and we can thank Russ Solomon. We sold a thousand commercials, one minute commercials, a dollar a holler, about a thousand dollars, and I was able to make payroll in the first month or so. When you're only paying $165 a month, a thousand dollars goes a long way. But you also have a shoe company, they were big. Oh, that's right. Shaq. Yeah. Chapkins, Guild Houses, Shoes. Remember those guys. Well, Frank Charlie, um, I get together every few months with uh, some guys that I went to Sac State with. And uh, you know some of them, Dan Scheibel, who was at Channel 3 for many years, a helicopter guy. A fellow named Frank Rosa, who has been around town doing marketing forever. A guy named uh, Peter Bowen and I. We get together at Sam's Hofbrau. And we speak an entirely different language. People have no idea what we're like all these guys, there's this, this intrinsic love of radio. I don't know where it comes from. I know as a kid. It's a serious infection. It is. I know as a kid, you know, I'd stay up late at night listening to the transistor radio. And with the nature of an AM frequency, you 
big pickup stations in the Midwest. And it was just fascinating. So I went to Sac State after I graduated from Colorado High in Placerville. Uh, I was in drama and speech, and I walked by the radio station, and that was it. I had to do this. So I, that's how I initially got involved with radio. The difference between these three guys and, and me is that I took a, a different direction, got involved in the counterculture, and, uh, and was very political, etc. cetera. Um, so this fellow and I, a guy named Dwayne Heaps, and I started a show on KDRS, the college station. Uh, it was Friday nights from midnight to six. We called it Crystal Inflections. Reflections. <laughs> anyway, we were doing all kinds of stuff, and uh, it, it, was, it was the only program we liked that in 1967, I guess it would have been. Um, to the point that one day, uh, Jimi Hendrix was coming to town for performance at uh, Sac State, and the promoter called and said, how would you like to have breakfast with the band? Okay. <laughs> um, and actually, after breakfast, I was telling Dory, Went over to the bar, I was 17 years old, and had, had uh, screwdrivers with Jimmy Hendrix. It was quite an experience. Um, another hallmark of that show was, uh, was having the uh, poet Allen Ginsberg come up, and he stayed up all night till 6 in the morning with us, playing his melodeon, coming up with poetry off the top of his head. So we had a lot of stuff going on. and. Um, Lots of conversations that would go on until 6 in the morning, lots of music. So one afternoon, I get a phone call. It was uh, Fred Davis, who was one of the original jocks, a guy named J.B. Winans. Uh, they were both still in high school. And uh, they said, this, this thing is in the works, and it may happen that an underground radio station in Sacramento, would you be interested? And I said, well, sure. So I took off that summer. Uh, up to Seattle when my parents had moved. And I came back, so that was in September, October, and things came into motion, and we got that radio station on the air. But uh, yeah, I just want to let everybody know there's something about that radio thing that gets in your blood. It's hard, it, and I was in it for 40 years, and it was really hard to break that uh, time. We're going to do question and answer. Well, that's the result of people on the air who uh, have really no idea what they're doing. Right? <laughs> Other than, um, it would be fair to say that we were caught up in that moment. And if there was ever uh, a radio station, in my opinion, that could capture, oh, what in the heck is going on, at least in terms of music, uh, having somebody like Jeff at the helm really helped. I remember getting phone calls from people, and I'm not exaggerating, who cried. They said, oh, that was the most beautiful segue. You went from this song to that song, and you kind of painted uh, this pattern that was so wonderful. And I go, oh, okay, that's great. Uh, anything else I can help? Literally, we were painting a mosaic in sound that we were not really truly aware of. Um, well, I want to pick up on what you said about not really knowing what we were doing. I was on the air one day, and we were talking about Johnny Hyde, and he calls up. He says, Harry, I want to congratulate you. You've had a great book. And I said, gee, thanks, Johnny. And he 
I love it. I remember coming over here and saying, Ed, what's a book? <laughs> I had no idea what the ratings were or any of those kind of things, but then Johnny actually hired me. He wanted me to go work at Croy. And so I remember it was supposed to start a certain day, and I told Ed I was going to go there, and he called me a week earlier and said, come in on Saturday night because we want to break you in. It was before I was supposed to do that. So I went over there, and the power went off, thank God. So I was trying to play the, those 45s after having played 33 LPs. I couldn't. It was gone in a second, you know, I'm trying to get it queued up, I just couldn't get in that, plus the music was just nuts. I was so depressed just sitting there, we got calls all night while we were off the air, people requesting stuff, and I kept trying to tell them we're off the air, and they didn't care, and then Chuck Roy, that you had the picture up there, he comes in and he gives me a lecture on why you don't do drugs and radio, you know, <laughs> and by that time, I, I went home and I said, I cannot do this, this and please bring me back. <laughs> and let me stay, thank God. Did you have a question? He's, he's somewhere back east, I think, living a fairly quiet life. I would like to add to the previous topic, regardless of what you may have heard tonight, to work at KZAP from the beginning through at least the first five years, you had to really no music, and not just the hot contemporary hit music or the albums. I mean, you had to have the depth. You had to know, uh, you know, folk music, bluegrass, blues, uh, John Fahey, you know, all that stuff, and and uh, you just had that encyclopedic knowledge of music, and and everyone who came to Kaza was good at that. And, and I have to say about Freeform Radio, if you're not playing the tribes of New Guinea, what are you doing? Well, what about Gregorian Chants? Gregorian, Gregorian Chants, we played, yeah. There were, there were 10,000 albums in the library or more, and I always used to say that if you couldn't find something you like, you should bring something from home. We've got a couple of pictures here in the control room, so you can see that's just a very small part. This is looking across the desk. That's me and Fred Gaines up on the right. And then we got another shot from the other side, so you can see more records. That's Helen Lillian and Robert Williams. What is that about Surface 74? Uh, yeah, seven, I think it's 70, what well, we moved in 73, so 73. So. That's the Elks Temple. And then there was a back room that had that many records in it, too. And that's just what was there. So, uh, you know, you could, there was anything you wanted was pretty much there to play. Now, sometimes there was a, one of the early announcers got tired of getting requests for um, Grand Funk Railroad. So he broke all the records over his knee. If you, if you wanted to play those, you were out of luck because they were all broken, but they were in the light. White shirt. On the 13th floor, we did a lot of we did a lot of concerts. 14th floor, yeah. Yeah, it would be 14th. We were on the 13th. KZAP was never a big heavy metal station, though. I remember when I got there, the Led Zeppelin album had because you would write down your comments and it said, "This one doesn't have much shouting in it," which was a, a, a recommendation to play that. I don't think there was much real heavy. No, I think yeah. the heaviest was Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't heavy metal, but it was the heavier rock. There was one problem in Top 40 where the fact was the fact that the songs were always pretty short. So anybody on the air uh, that had to go potty would go grab uh, you know, Paso or something and play that. Of course, you'd be there in the bathroom and you'd hear it on the speaker and you'd say, well, I've got uh, another minute and two seconds to get back on you know, there because you were always either talking over the intro or the extra, because in Top 40 Radio, it was just jabber, 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 jabber from one song to the, to the next. So the beauty of Hayes of course, is we might play something that's 20 minutes long, like one of the Grateful Dead tunes that I always like. I did, I, and I did more than go to the bathroom to the whole thing, so what's the free play, I'll tell you that. Well, I put on, every day for lunch, I put on a long cut so I could have my carrots and goat cheese. And <laughs> That was my break. <laughs> and 
And speaking of music, I always had to listen to Jeff at night to find out the things that nobody else was going to play <laughs> during the daytime hours. And my favorite song of his that he turned me on to was Lily done the Santa Uji every time I pulled her coat tail. Love it, Van Peebles. Love it, Van Peebles. Listen, in the very early days, that would ring a bell. Very funky song. Very funky. Yeah. Right, on our frequency, by the way, 98.5. And then, you know, Casey and I moved to Sacramento, and then it got changed to the frequency. Um, was there a rivalry? Did you guys uh, get together? Was there a sense of community, or were you guys just isolated from each other? Well, um, Tom Donahue and I stayed in touch, and, and maybe Charlie, too, when he was the music director. Uh, Tom, because he was very famous in the industry. His nickname was Big Daddy. He was the Big Daddy. And I don't just mean physically. Um, he would get albums three weeks before they were released. So when that would happen, we would deal with the Stones and the Beatles. He'd call me up. I would drive to San Francisco. He had two real, real tapes in his office. And we'd run off a copy. And on the way back to Sacramento, I could hear the jocks on the air going, Tonight at 9 o'clock, you can hear the new Beatles album, the White Album. We were just called the Beatles, we didn't call the White Album yet. But you know, so there was that kind of communication. There's a lot of personal relationships among the jocks at different stations. I think, I don't know about anybody else, but KFG always got on my nerves because when I'm driving to the Bay Area, just as somebody's doing something really cool on KZ, I'm They were there for us. Probably unknown to most, but when we came on the air, KSKO was not on the air at the time. I'm not sure why. I'm not even sure the uh, call letter existed at the time. But So we had free reign. And back then, uh, we had listeners in the Bay Area that could pick up K's app. Um, my boss, the guy that owned the station, Big Hagen, called us the day we went on the air about 3 in the afternoon. And he just uh, almost, well, he, he was very upset because I had said the word hell. What a hell of a day, I said, something like that. And back then, you just don't use words like that up here. And I said to my friends, how the heck did you hear that? But uh, when KSJO was not on the air, it was easy enough to pick us up down there if we had the good tuner and good antenna. So. And then you talk about good relations with the Elks. That wasn't always true. There was, a, there was an elevator guy oh, named Jake. Jake. Jake the elevator. Oh, great story. Jake wouldn't like to pick us up and take us up to the top, and he wouldn't like to come back to bring you down. And you'd have to wait a long time. And I think one time, I think Bill's back, and Jake actually got into it. He got into it. I was, I was in the elevator. Which really wasn't fair, because Jake was about 80 years old at the time. <laughs> back, back then, it was not an automatic elevator, so you had the yeah, yeah, you just wait for it. But, but there is a great story, and then I know we want to get very, very entertaining uh, video up here for you. But we have time. Uh, I get another story. Yeah, th this is a, is a great story. Remember that I'm tiptoeing around the Elks Temple trying to get us not kicked out. They're looking for some way to break the peace. The last thing we want to do is be creating problems. Somehow or another, uh, we may be. Um, I, I don't want to go so far as to say somebody might have smoked a joint or something like that, but by the way, I was straight arrow, straight arrow when I came to work. Uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Anyway, bottom line, one day, I believe it was Jeff, got on top of the elevator, and uh, I forget who was operating it, it definitely wasn't Jay. And they went up to one of the floors, and they opened and they said, step in. And this person in a wheelchair, I might add, because at that point they were renting to folks uh, at low um, rent, stepped in, and the man in his wheelchair starts going and says, There's hippies on the elevator, there's hippies on the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of the elevator. Right. The actual elevator was below so Please step in and, and watch the cables. Yeah. You have a story. Well, one of my favorite case up stories is our staff meetings. We were communal, you know. I mean, eight of us lived in the big N Street house. We all had dinner together, because we couldn't afford 165 a month. We couldn't afford individual 
department, so we have this big house. But um, we have staff meetings on a pretty regular basis. Anyone can come, the janitor, salespeople, the, the secretarial staff, I mean, anyone was welcome, and everyone had an equal voice, and we all had to agree on every decision that was made. So these things would go on forever. I mean, for three, four, maybe five hours. It seemed like five hours. And, uh, and my favorite one of all was we had a new time sales book just started. And uh, you can kind of see him wait for his moment to jump in, you know. And so he kind of, after about an hour and a half or so, he, he sees a moment and he goes, Hey, I've got some good news. Oh, really? What's that? He goes, I decided to advertise a contact with Bank of America. And the room exploded. No way, no way, we are not going to advertise Bank of America. And he had to go back to a terrible contract. And he said, they won't, they won't run your ads. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. You can. Uh, 23rd and still there. That was a kind of different color. But, uh, it, you know, they had a basement. I lived there, Ken Odell. I mean, craftsman. By the way, there's a word you never want to hear about case at. We say frickin' don't we? Oh. <laughs> naughty, naughty. Well, uh, yeah, I got those meetings were uh, kind of nuts. I mean, you'd be working, you'd have a certain shift, and everyone would get together, and we'd all decide to work different shifts. You know, just overnight, you know, just here, yeah. go here, go there. And you could just hang around. You talk about being a meeting. You could just hang around the station and, and eventually you'd get on the air. <laughs> Drop Taft, just hung around. He got on the air. We Taft hung around. around. He got on the air. We abandoned the, the, the traditional work week. So you worked four days and then three off, four days and three off. So it was no Monday through Friday any longer. But, but uh, wasn't that also motivated so that the uh, weekend air, air guys and gals would get paid more. If it was unfair, we're getting uh, 165 every month. And these poor guys are getting like three or four dollars an hour. So I think that was part of the reason we did I don't remember the money, but probably. I, I just remember it. Three or four dollars. Let's get rid of the work week. I got, a, I got a shout out to Dennis, though, after I came back and I was doing the, the health thing again. <laughs> I'd come on to Dennis, I'd be on the dentist's show and I'd do my thing. And, Every time I do a show, Dennis would find a record or some song that would equate to the topic. Now, there aren't a lot of things in rock and roll about enemies or, you know. <laughs> there are now. There are <laughs> Fecal examination or whatever the hell it was. Somehow, he would find it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's that screaming Jay Hawkins. <laughs> that, 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 that,
two-way radios started getting case out. It's <laughs> <laughs> a true, absolutely true story. It wasn't on purpose, but it was cool, quite frankly. Well, Norman Brown, the chief engineer of Channel 6 at the time, uh, being the technical individual he was, figured out what the problem was and said, no, 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 they didn't do this on purpose. No, Mr. Lee, is this? Of course we did. No, we did not do it on purpose. Um, and we got a call from, uh, from Gorman Brown telling us to take that, we won't use that word again, by the way, transmitter off the air. Uh, and we didn't increase power again. I think it was at least a couple of years. I was long gone by that time. So that fellow that we paid, I won't tell you how we paid him. Uh, there was no way to get that money back. It was gone, but he didn't do a very good job. But, uh, there was a little time there where you couldn't, if you were a deputy sheriff of the city of Sacramento or the county, uh, you could listen to the case if you wanted to. <laughs> John Mistley took us on as uh, his favorite thing to hate, and he and I don't know how many of you remember him, but. He was your typical big, fat, obnoxious, cigar smoking, obnoxious policeman. And I have friends who are policemen, so they're not all that way. But John was just a blowhard, bully, and uh, he hated Kazo. He, because he, you know, he just, he used to, come, he, he would get drunk every day at lunch. You could see him, you see him leading him back to the office about two o'clock, and he'd get on the phone. He was. I know you're smoking pot down there. He calls us up. So I can tell by the sound of the radio, you guys are smoking pot down there. Oh, no, we're not, John. I can smell that radio. Right on the ledge, you know, there's a little concrete ledge outside the station. <laughs> the person was at that radio, and it was very intimate sound compared to AM radio, so everyone just assumed we were always, you know, loaded, but it was just the, the nature of the communication. Remember the sound factory? Did you ever go to the, <laughs> did you ever go to the sound factory? Well, the fellow ran it for a while, Whitey Davis, had to come work off some of his debt to the station because he owed a lot of money. And I remember one time with an unnamed lady, I should, won't mention any names, but Whitey pre-recorded his show in the morning so he could bring this young lady up and have a night, whatever the heck he was doing, you know, and I remember listening to the show that day and I said, darn. This sounds just like the show he did the other day. <laughs> he played the entire previous day show. Uh, let's just put it this way. I lived in Rancho at the time, and I wondered why I was hearing the same comments, the same music. <laughs> so I decided to drive downtown from Rancho Cordova and up the elevator, open that door you saw, walk in, and there's Whitey Davis with two women, totally naked. Well, I, didn't know there were, I didn't know there were two women. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The and of course, uh, I was pretty upset because I hadn't been invited. <laughs> Our little place up there was pretty unique. By the time I got there, they must have fired the janitor because it was a pigsty. <laughs> but just off of the control room that we showed you was the balcony that Carrie's picture was on. Uh, 13 floors above Sacramento, you can kind of see the little niche where it is, and it's not much bigger than one of these floor tiles. <laughs> and that was a nice, well-ventilated place for those who wanted to partake. What I wanted to do, and I did one time, is lean over the edge and drop a Super Bowl, Super Bowl on the J Street. I never saw that anybody got hurt, and I never saw that Super Bowl again, but it must have bounced halfway across town. Yeah, I used to fling 45. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, are there any other quick questions? Go ahead. Pardon? Ed, Ed Fong? Ed Fong? Well, he's, oh, yes, Ed Fong did. He's still around. He was later. He was mid 70s. He's, he's still around. He's retired from the state.
I think I cried. Jeff Houston, Carrie Nosner, and Charlie Reese. Yeah. Jeff Houston, and Fisher. General Manager, Mr. Jeff Houston. Yep. Carrie. And Charlie Reese. Mr. Jeff Houston. Oh, Mr. Jeff, you want to intro what's going to happen now? Well, yes. Um, some of you may be aware of a documentary film that's been in production for close to three years now, and we expect it to be finished by the end of this year. And it's a study, it's the story, really, of freeform radio in its birthplace, um, which is really California. Uh, and it, you know, KZ is part of it, started off as a documentary. And we're fortunate to have the um, producer, co-producer, and the director with us. And uh, if he wanted to stand up, he would have done so. Um, but uh, and I'm working on it too. And, and it's just we've gone around and interviewed about 200 people, ex-jobs and and uh, musicians of the era, and they, you know, we talked about. Why was freeform radio so important? And what did it mean to you? And uh, we are of the opinion that it really did change the world. I mean, we we, we tried to take away people's thought, and we, you know, back in '68 there was no feminism, there was no health food, you know, all the back to earth movements just going on. You know, all these things started in that same world. Revolution, and uh, so we made this very exciting uh, movie. And tonight we're going to get a special preview taken from the film, focusing on Kaze. This is nerve scene. Yes, sir. Oh, I, 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 it, it was it was laid out on the second floor of the second Kaze building one day, and I got there late. Uh, they asked. It had been picked over. I think Charlie took over the blues and jazz before I got there. And the only record I took was the one with Lily doing the same. <laughs> so after that, they probably took it to a record, used record store. That was the corporate owners. That was after. Just one thing. KZAP sold in uh, 78, no, six, when it's 73 after Gahagan died, for $200,100. Yeah, right in there. And by the next time, radio stations in this town were going for four, five, six million. And then, so it turned into a business. It didn't have anything to do with free form or music or anything. It had to do with selling ads. And we put it on the air for sixty-five thousand, and it sold the last time to the morons who went country music for fourteen million dollars. And they just watched the money fly off into the sunset. So when Lee Gahagan decided that he wasn't going to lose any sleep over not being able to make a salary, um, he, he obviously had a good feel for where this might head out, so he wasn't worried about it. The sad thing about Lee, and I might as well just mention it, a brilliant, brilliant Princeton student who knew nothing about love, and it killed him. His first love left him, and he took his life over. I think that sums it up. So as together as a person might be, sometimes we're not together in the right way. It's a sad, sad thing. And Lee was a great guy. And this part of what gave us the freedom we had at Case App is that we would come up with all this crazy stuff, crazy ideas. We go to Ed and say, we want to do this now. And go, we can't do that. Go, Ed, that's what we want to do. And he would call up Lee and say, Lee, you won't believe it. Now they want to do this. And Lee's response was the same every time. Ed, they're the artists, they'll do what they want to do. So we love yeah. Which reminds me, one quick thing, in case you don't know, Congress years ago said, we want more radio in the community, it's been a long process. But in the next few years, you're gonna start hearing a lot of low power FM stations come up that have to be nonprofit, have to be community oriented in one way or another. So you might start hearing some interesting radio again, but keep your ears. library closes in 15 minutes, but we got time for more questions if anybody has any. Any of you guys want to talk about what you saw up there? Oh, we got a question, sorry. Is it true that one of the alternate call letters that the attorney suggested for a station was K-Pod? Um, that's a joke. 
My mic's on, and that's a memory that I have. I don't know about it being a joke, but we were working in the studio one afternoon, hammering and cutting, and our lawyer from DC called and said that, uh, you know, you submit a list, I think 50 call letters to the FCC, and they tell you what's available. Like Ed said, KSAC wasn't available because that's Strategic Air Command. But he, <laughs> He says, and Ed's on the phone, he's relaying it to us, and he says, uh, the, the guy from the FCC told us um, there's two call letters that are available, KPOT, KZAP. He said, so I told him, KPOT, you want KPOT? And everyone who was there went, no, 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 KZAP. We want KZAP. That's my memory. Well, it's a bit faulty. Uh, <laughs> the, the call letter KPOT actually did come off the lips of somebody at the FCC, but it was in the context of, there are calls that we probably wouldn't license. KPOT would be one, KSEX might be another. I mean, obviously there were call letters that we wouldn't want to begin with, but they were simply trying to point out that all of these call letters that you might think about, they're the book. So, we'll go ahead. I defer to the master. <laughs> yes. I first started listening to KPAP when I moved to the area in 1973. At that point, we were playing pretty much album oriented rock music. So I was a little bit surprised to hear about the early days when there was like folk and jazz and world music. So I'm curious how, how and why that. Program director. Program director and change of ownership. <laughs> change of ownership happened in 73 after Lee died for a year. The station was run by his aunt, who didn't really want to be running the station. And we were all making, well, 375 a month, which was better than minimum wage, but not by much. And uh, I think people it's when stations started to look like they had value and money could be made here, and I think some people maybe you guys might have gotten into it when you were young enough to be able to work for next to nothing, and later on people wanted it as a career, which wouldn't happen if your checks bounced. So I think it was just the, the uh, uh, evolution of radio, which unfortunately went to a terrible place, and that was just the beginning of that, where the formats got tighter and tighter, and the music got more and more focused and less broad. But when we did move over to the new location, that was a great time. That was a great staff, good people, that's I true. think they put out a good product for the, the time. The new owners were good. They came from Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. They knew nothing about radio, but fortunately they didn't really want to tell us how to run the radio station. They were, they were okay people. One of the guys was an ex-Marine. He had a temper from time to time, and I remember one night he said, I'm going to do a shift. I can do a shift. I can sit in the air and I can do this. Puts his headphones on, opens the mic, does a break, does something wrong, like started the record wrong or something, backs up and goes, <laughs> over the air. He was a little less, he was a little more uh, willing to listen to what we had to say about formatting them, and I don't think he ever did shoot it after that either. That was later, that was quite a bit later. Yeah. KZAP was on the air for 23 years. KZAP was on for 23 years, and it's been off for 23 years. Who gave up the Question. Roger Shepard. Roger Shepard, who, uh, he lived at the N Street House for a while, and he was, uh, if you want to see a lot of his work, you can come to the Sacramento Rock and Radio Museum on Second Saturday. Um, and he designed that logo. He designed the stuff for uh, Shire Road Pub, for Crabshaw Corner, for KSFM, KSF's competition. And he did a version that you can see hanging on the wall at Time Tested Books. I think that's the early yes. version. Yeah. Then Gordo's brother Bill, who was an uh, art student and also worked at KDVS, redid it. And there's a whole story there about he never got paid and he never got credit, but that's uh, Bill Styler, Gordo Styler's brother, did the one that we showed when we started tonight. 
Well, I think I remember the bumper sticker now. Ed, didn't Paul Marion do the bumper sticker? The original. Yeah, yeah he the original. Did. The purple he showed. Yeah. That is a purple. fact. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I, I, after I, can I left, that. but that's not because I left. I worked, I worked at KZAP longer more than, than anyone. More than anybody. Three different times, right? That's right. At least. <laughs> so, 70, 68 to 72, then it changed hands till 77 or 78. <clears throat> then a group called Western Cities Broadcasting came in. Um, and that was pretty much the end of anything with extemporaneous, extemporaneousness to it. They, they installed what was called a superstar format, a very tight rock and roll format. And uh, that was, they were the owners. It was Western Cities out of Vegas for a number of years. And then when it changed, right before, well, a few years before it changed format to country, it was actually owned by Nationwide Insurance. And uh, yeah, nationwide, you're, we're on your side. So there were there were numerous ownerships, and it seems like every time the ownership changed, the format tightened. Well, and again, radio stations were millions of dollars then, so oh, yeah. they had debt service. They had to worry about paying. Yeah, and the investors. superstar format was hugely popular. I mean, yeah, and, and the ratings went to zoom through the roof. Oh, yeah. So it was successful. It just wasn't what we I, had uh, become yeah. accustomed to. But that was happening all across the country. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap it up, any other questions? Mm. Nope. One quick question. Do you happen to know the address of the N Street house? <laughs> I would guess. Who said that? <laughs> Bill? Is that true? Bill is say 2308. You said 2208? 2208. Yeah. One house up from the corner, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, one or two. I, uh, and there's a huge redwood tree in front. There's a family that lives there. I stopped by there a little under a year ago and talked to them. They're sitting on the porch. And it's still the same structure. They've got it painted green. We had, we were red, I think. Or, you know, I don't know. It's a different color. They didn't run away yelling, there's hippies on the porch? <laughs> and it was built for a former governor of California. Hmm. Was, it was called the KZAP House. There was eight of us living there, three stories. Beautiful place. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Okay. Anything else? Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Give these guys a hand.